Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. Thank you for listening, everyone. The texts for October 18, 2020, which is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, are Isaiah 45, 1 through 7. The semi-continuous first reading is Exodus 33, 12 through 23. The Psalm 96, 1 through 9, and you can throw in the optional verses, verses of 10 through 13. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 10, we move into that. And then we have Matthew 22, 15 through 22. So, so uh, Jesus is still in the temple. It's the last week of his life. These different groups of uh, the Judaism of Jesus' day have been coming to see him. We've had the chief priests and the elders and the Pharisees. And now a new group, the Pharisees together with the Herodians. From what I understand, this is, um, this is sort of like Vikings and Packers fans coming and agreeing on something. Right? Pharisees and Herodians, uh, they don't usually work together, do they? Well, we don't know exactly who the Herodians were because they're only mentioned in the New Testament. But it would seem from their name that they're pro-Herod. <laughs> I'm just guessing that would be pretty pretty safe guess. Uh, while the Pharisees for the, weren't a political party, but for the most part were suspicious of Hellenistic um, infusion of ideas and cultural um, influences. So yeah, we've probably got, we've probably got, uh, you know, Chuck Schumer here with Mitch McConnell saying, how do we, how do we get rid of this guy? Well, and well, but and in addition to uh, the Pharisees, in addition to the Herodians, you have this uh, the this yoking of these uh, two parties coming to uh, coming to Jesus. I, you know, one of the striking aspects of of this passage, you know, we, we're moving now, verses 15 through 46 are these conflict stories uh, between Jesus and the leaders. And, uh, and one of the striking aspects of this is the language uh, that, that, that recalls other language in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but it, uh, with regard to the, the testing uh, and the plotting against Jesus. So, then the Pharisees went and plotted. Uh, that's the same verb back from back in twelve, chapter twelve, verse fourteen. And so, this is not, of course, something new, but the way in which now the conflict has been heightened. And um, and then in verse eighteen, but Jesus, aware of their malice or aware of their uh, uh, evilness or something like that, um, is is the same verb or the same word that's used in the Lord's prayer uh, at, uh, when Jesus talks about um, beware of the, you know, beware of the evil one. And then, um, and then why are you putting me to the test, of course, goes back to chapter four and the testing of Jesus in the wilderness. So you have us all this, like, you know, this testing and, uh, and uh, the, 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 that awareness of it and the way in which Jesus finds himself now in a similar kind of situation uh, from the, uh, in the testing in the wilderness of, of, his, of his authority and recognizing his authority and, uh, and, and the way in which these forces uh, outside of God's intention are at work. And, um, and I think that connection to the Lord's prayer also can also at work in our own lives. And so that this not a, a, an awareness that these are, um, yes, these are tests or these are uh, challenges or conflicts that Jesus has to face as particularly as it gets closer to get closer to the passion narrative. Uh, but these are also, these are also challenges that we face uh, that, uh, these kinds of um, challenges to what we what we uh, what we believe and what to what will our loyalties be? So uh, that's a direction maybe I would take just to highlight some of that language and some of the yeah some of the um, some of the tension here and and the conflict in the language, but also uh, the connections with our own um, our own 
uh, the times that would that that's going to be also true for us as well. When I think about the moment that we live in, um, uh, and, and it sort of leans uh, back uh, to um, last week's, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the statement that you made now, uh, Ralph, about um, um, all parties aren't good parties or something like that, but that, that some of the things that the empire grants us are not gods. Um, so, so sometimes when I've looked at this text or I've heard this text preached, um, that the end of it where it's talking about, you know, do we, do we pay our taxes? You know, what is Caesar's? What is God's? And um, one way of reading this is simply a recognition that some of the things that the government gives us is not God's things. You know, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, which means they belong to him, not to God. Um, and and that's that's an interesting uh, twist, I think, uh, of a way to approach that question. Um, the other is the recognition here that it begins by saying, "Teacher, we know that you are sincere." And then Jesus responding, uh, because he knows their malice. And in response to Jesus saying, "Okay." Bring your coin here. Who's on that? Who does this belong to? Their response is to be amazed. Where are the places in our lives today where people are confronted with the presence and truth of the God made known in Jesus and they are amazed? And I kind of read this sort of uh, as amazed and speechless because it says, and they left him and went away. And I don't know how many examples we have of that right now. We, we don't pause. We get an answer and we run with it. And maybe this is a time for us to look for places where we can say, this is the word of a God and allow, allow people to be stunned into silence because God is so amazing. I don't know, that's a twist. Joy, when you say that the government, or this, however you want to define that, the authorities give gifts that aren't all useful or welcome or helpful gifts, how do you see that taking place here? Is that, is it, you know, is it because of what the coin looks like and says, or? Um, yeah, you know, Caesar's here. We, we, we've been given this coin. And Jesus says, whose image is on it? You know, it's, it's, an, it's the image of the person that's saying, give it back. And so give it to him. It's his. His, it, his. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spread the narrative here. But it's his. His image is on it. Give it back. Well, if Jesus is the son of God, it's what it means to be human. God's image is stamped on him in his holiness, in his faithfulness, in his generosity, in his patience, in his truthfulness. And, and they begin by saying, we see this in you. We see you're sincere. So what are you going to do? Are you going to follow your plan to destroy Jesus? Or are you going to give to God what is God's, the one who is the image bearer of God? Ouch. I got to stop and think about my plans on this one. I'm going to just walk away on this one. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting me go. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. I, I would add to that too, that not all, not all gifts that we receive from our common political life are welcome gifts in the sense that some carry obligations. Um, right, you're, you're welcome to play the game. You're welcome to benefit from Roman prosperity. But this is, these are the rules of the game you're going to have to play by. And, and part of those rules are stamped on this coin, right, that declares Tiberius the son of a deified Augustus, right, his uh, previous emperor. So there's a, um, yeah, it's, it's to be a part of the system, how far are you willing to go? which is a question the New Testament takes up all over the place and in different ways, right? The book of Revelation has very clear lines, very clear threats. Other books are a lot more 
vague on that, but here's a spot where I think Jesus is not so much saying, hey, you got your religious life and you got your political life, you know. He's he's not a he's not writing the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States here. Um, you know he's not trying to talk about a, these separate spheres of existence. He's talking about um, right, beware of these creeping obligations, these idolatrous relationships that we're called into. Wow, I love it. I, uh, I mean, we're recording this several weeks in advance. I don't know if on October 18th people will still be talking about politics in the United States or not. I'm, I'm guessing probably. You might be right. Yeah. And if you don't live in the U.S. and you're watching or listening to us, you might have heard we have an election coming up soon. Maybe you've read something about that in your newspapers. But I um I, I like uh, that you brought attention to the coin here in specific, Matt. I I have an old coin collection somewhere in my closet in, or in the basement somewhere from when I was a kid, and got interested in old coins. And uh, like you said. Um, you became an Old Testament scholar. Serves you right. <laughs> I know, right? But actually, <laughs> when, when my doctoral uh, student colleagues were all interested in coins, and that was a big part of their dissertation, I just stayed with the pure things of God and the Psalms, just go. so you know. No, um, you have no taste for numismatics. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> not, for, not for Old Testament numismatics. But I like this, right? Uh, I'm going to give you some deep Old Testament learned Skinner. But uh, like you already pointed out, so this is a coin, it, uh, the denarius, which has the head of the emperor, as you could tell in the text on it, probably Tiberius, and then an inscription, right? Uh, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. So in other words, son of God. And so you have both uh, a graven image and a confession of faith. Uh, so And so when Jesus says, yeah, reach, reach in your pocket and pull out one of those things. You know, what does it say? I mean, he's, he's sort of skewering them, showing them that we're all complicit in some way, right? In, uh, in the stuck in, worlds, stuck in a world uh, with violations of the Ten Commandments, which we had two weeks ago uh, for, uh, in the semi-continuous lectionary last week, the, uh, the graven image that it, uh, Aaron makes here, they're all carrying a graven image with a confession to another God in their pocket. I really wish the zealots had been there. Uh, they're the group of first century Jews that are missing in this scene because you got the Herodians. What if the zealots had been there? Because they would have been like really mad about the coin. Um, but doesn't it, I, I think you've in past years, Matt, just kind of said, you know, there. it's by doing this, Jesus is kind of you know, pointing out to them the impossible ways in that in which we're all complicit in uh, denying God or, or something. No way out of it, right? Well, I think so. Yeah, this has often been taken as here Jesus declares himself politically neutral. I mean, true, he's unwilling to play the game that his testers have tried to put him into. But I think he is saying there's a there's a price we pay. I mean, I I, I do think he's saying something critical of Roman propaganda and what he would probably call or would view as the kind of the idolatrous nature of, of Rome's claims about its own importance. And then it's like, what are you doing carrying one of these in the temple in the first place? You know, it's this, this is Latin coinage with, with an image on it. This is, we're, you're in shekel country. Um, and what are you doing with that? So there is a, there's a, there's an, I think he's embarrassing them in front of the crowd as well, which is important for us. I don't, he also doesn't say, you know, therefore it's, let's get ourselves a ship and find an island far away from the Roman Empire. It's just not feasible. So, but there is a, a kind of recognition of the, what's the word I want, the, the, the way we're all saturated by this complicity. Joy, you keep. Either you're nodding in deep, deep agreement or you want to jump in. I'm nodding in gr deep agreement because the question I was going to ask is, um, weren't they not supposed to have that coin in the first place? I, I had been taught that and I couldn't remember it and you just answered it, is, is that Jesus is, you know, just by saying, pull out a coin and say, like, oh yeah, 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 I got one. And it's like, really? You got one? <laughs> And, and, and he says, yes, yeah, show me the coin used for the tax. Like, show me what coin they're making you use. Right, 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 right. And pull it out right here in the temple, why don't you? I got it, yeah. 
wait a minute, I shouldn't have it here. And that's our complicity. That's how easily we get sucked into, into the game. And um, I don't know, Matt, I would say that this is a place where Jesus is very clearly making his statement. Um, you know, uh, that he's not playing this game and he's calling us out on it. Carolyn? Well, and I think too, uh, the, just all of those dynamics of, yeah, that's like you said, Matt, this is shuckle country, not, yeah, not, but the reality is it's both, uh, in that, in that, that, and that's, and that's the, that's the environment in which the disciples, which they all live, uh, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a Roman colony and, and, and completely, you know, Hellenized and you have imperial propaganda everywhere. Uh, and that, and that these are the, these are the these are the tests, if you will. So that larger, you know, that larger framework in this in this passage, or this that larger theme of 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 navigating these these tests or these challenges or these um, these uh, the ways in which your loyalties are going to be challenged, I think is that that larger theme. And especially when, I mean, one of the, one of the ironies or one of the uh, really striking things about this is, is recognizing how much, of course, um, um, in the imperial, the imperial cult and the imperial um, propaganda and such has infiltrated into everything. And, uh, and, and where, where might we point that out in our own situations where, you know, we like to, uh, we, we like, we, how, how do we navigate that? Do we separate ourselves out? Uh, do we, and we can't. And so we, we exist in those same kinds of, of like, like you were talking about, well, those same kinds of complicit, that's complicity, uh, but those same kinds of systems that, that vie for that vie for our loyalties, and so I think that's that's a critical aspect of this uh, aspect of this passage. All right, one uh, last comment, and then the deep Bible learning I promised uh, Matt a minute ago. So, in fact, if you go ahead to the end of the gospel, go to all nations and make disciples. Jesus does not want his disciples to withdraw from their societies. In fact, when he says, "Pay the tax." Uh, you, you, know, you should almost uh, render unto Caesar, actually probably better, pay the damn tax, right? Uh, I want you in the world making disciples, therefore you cannot retreat uh, into uh, an abbey or you know, into an island. Um, so here's the other thing, All right? So when coins were first introduced, um, they were introduced as a weight of silver that was a set weight so that you knew when you were exchanging silver it's not yet money, it's silver. Uh, and, and then the local, the local um, authority would put his head, usually his, right, on, on the coin to show that it was one weight, whatever one was. Uh, the word shekel actually just means a weight. To shekel is to weigh. And so a shekel is a weight, meaning one. And um, so originally the head on the coin was a sign of fidelity that this is, this is one, I've made these coin, and then it becomes propaganda later. Oh, as long as my head's on there, let's, I'm the son of God, right, Sonia? All right. Did you okay. learn that in your, did you learn that in your um, PhD program or when you were in your third grade coin collection? I learned that uh, in recent years from reading books. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's, uh, we better rock on. Uh, well, okay, so, but I think that, I mean, what we're just talking about now um, is like you said, Rolf, this is not an either or, uh, it, you know, to pull yourself out. Uh, and I think that moving ahead to, to the great commission is really critical. This is, this is the reality in which the disciples find themselves. So then that makes Isaiah's passage a little challenging for me, um, paired with this because while it's true, like I am the Lord and there is no other, uh, the reality is we live in a we live in, in an environment where uh, where there's competition for lords and so um, it, I find this passage I find this pairing then really not sure what to do with it 
except you could, you know, preach it on its own. But you see what I'm saying? Like, I think it's, it's really, it, it makes this claim that, that, uh, Yes, we can make that claim, but it, but part of what this part of what the Matthew text is showing is that we live in, we live in, in the environment of these of these competing, um, competing and uh, yeah, competing authorities or competing um, kingdoms. The this this passage from Isaiah forty five is so there's so much history you have to know to understand the poetry. It's, it's one of the real problems with having a four text lectionary where you're just throwing texts one after another at a congregation uh, without introduction. Um, it, so it's, it's, this is probably from just before 540 when Cyrus and the Persians defeat the Babylonians and then tell all the people that are exiled there, you can go home. Um, Cyrus is the Persian emperor, Cyrus the Great, but he is called here the Lord's anointed, right? His Mishiach. Uh, you know, it's one of the places where you get the definite, a definite. Um, sometimes they say that the Messiah never occurs in the Old Testament, but here it is definite, uh, is a definite use. But it's of a foreign emperor who is not a Yahweh worshiper. And the point is, the point of this text is, Believe it or not, God is at work in the reign of Cyrus the Great, who is God's Messiah at this time for the sake of Jacob and Israel, it says. I mean, so the good news uh, maybe is that even if your worst, whoever you think the worst option gets elected president next month, even if that happens, God can be at work behind that worst possible thing in your worldview. I worry. I am, what's that? Because I am the Lord and there is no other, says God. I was just going to say my worry is the way in which this particular text has been used as propaganda in our society in the last four years, um, certainly before then as well. But this idea of who are the Cyruses among us, right? How how is God at work in our common political life? And so texts like this have been used. So it's, I'm just, and preachers probably know this because they know their settings better than I do, but there's a trap waiting for you this week if you wander into this text um, in election season without being really careful about um, how your words may or may not sound encoded <laughs> to people. But also to say, what happens when political parties grab biblical texts and start using them as well for their own um, benefit? I really appreciate that, Matt, because we do, we will have this tendency to use it and we'll want to use it for our side, whoever are, is. And um, the, the thing to note on here is, first of all, that it's very clear that Cyrus, as Roth has just identified, is not one of the people of God. He's not a worshiper of Yahweh. So first of all, he's very clearly an outsider. Uh, but the other piece that's in here that I think we have to recognize is that the provider of our riches is not Cyrus. The provider of our riches is the Lord our God, and that this is about uh, verse three, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. And you know me, I'm going to play with that naming and the image bearing that I already talked about uh, when we were talking about uh, Jesus and the coin. Um, I, I, I just see that in there. You know me, I tie it all together. Let's just jump to Exodus 33 for the semi-continuous Old Testament folks, especially if anybody took up my uh, invitation and has done a few weeks on this. Um, you, this is just one of the great texts and confusing texts of the Bible, uh, and it's fantastic. But so um, there's a back and forth between God and Moses, and you know, if I have found favor in your sight, you know. Uh, 
and again, uh, Vanessa Lovelace's uh, commentary is fantastic. Um, then God says, you cannot see my face for no one shall so so see me and live. And so then uh, God puts Moses in a cleft in the rock, right? And uh, covers him with his hand and then passes by so that uh, Moses only sees his backside. Uh, I think that's great. I mean, that's sort of a great humbling text for us. We, you might think you know something about God because you have a PhD in theology, but you know, really all you've got is this little bit of back, God's backside that you've seen. You don't know much about God. And then guess what I'm going to do, Caroline? I'm going to add verses. Yay! Because, because the next part is absolutely critical because what happens then in the next part is God reveals uh, the fullness of God's name. God passes by, and this is, um, this theophany is, just essential to the Old Testament and declares, uh, I am the Lord, you know, um, gracious, uh, gracious and merciful, slow to anger. And uh, anyway, it's a fantastic text. Uh, one that I think I've heard preach once in my life only. Uh, and I would love to hear more on this text from preacher. I was struck in um, verse uh, 19 and 20, that God's gracious, uh, God's mercy is to hide Moses from the fullness, the, the impact of the fullness of his glory. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the question for me is in the midst of the storm, where we feel like we just need a glimpse of God. We just need a confirmation of the presence of God. I just need to know God, are you with me? Um, that we would remain humble. I think you've already said this, that we will remain humble to say, that's all we need is a glimpse because that's all we can handle. And, and God is gonna spare us from being overwhelmed. Uh, and, and so are we willing in the midst of the storm as we seek God's presence to be hidden in the cleft? Yeah, you know, and I just, I'm just thinking about this is Moses wants the presence of God. God says, I'll give you an angel. No, I want you. And then what God gives is God's name. That's why you got to keep reading into verse 30, uh, chap, uh, chapter 34. The name is what God gives us. So we don't, we don't have an image of God. Uh, you know, um, all the, the gospels never describe Jesus and his appearance ever. Uh, and so even all of our images of Jesus tend to look like we look like culturally, no matter who the we is. And, uh, but what we do have is we have, God has given us God's name to use in prayer and praise and thanksgiving. And the name is worth more than the image. I think that's I think that's so interesting too when you think about uh, when you go back and say in verse eighteen Moses said show me your glory I pray, and so how is it that the answer the answer then to what glory is is God's name and everything that 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 communicates and so how we how we define glory and how we think about glory and what does what did Moses assume in that. Uh, is rather given in um, knowledge of God by name and and all of all of what that implies about God's glory. I think you, I think a preacher could do a lot with that uh, and thinking about and thinking about that relationship between God's name and this is like you were talking about Rolf. This is God's glory, and that image bearing is is humanity. Um, that that the icon of God that we are not to make, God has made in creating male and female to bear God's image in the flesh. And, and, and so uh, that leans us into what it means uh, to be imitators of Christ. Uh, if, if, if we are going to reflect what Christ-like, God-like presence on earth looks like, then we who bear God's image, humanity, are to be noticeably, undeniably um, 
follow um, imitators. I, I followers aren't enough. Um, imitators of Jesus. I just leaned into Thessalonians here. That's all we did there. I would use the psalm liturgically. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. You have to sing it. It says, so sing to the Lord. It would be so lame, like, to just, you know, say it. So that's, that's all I have to say about the psalm. And I'm going to I'm gonna jump in on the, on the psalm to say there, there have been some questions about for those congregations that are gathering, should they be singing? And, um, and since that is the very danger right now, um, I pushed beyond that to say, what is that singing about? And it is, it, the question uh, I wanna ask those who are arguing is, are we singing to soothe ourselves or are we singing as a signal of God's presence? Because verse three says that that singing is to declare God's glory among the nations. So that's what I want to say about using that liturgically. <laughs> Bearing the glory of God. Now we can do Thessalonians. All right. So we've got, uh, if you do not uh, observe Reformation Sunday, you have five Sundays in a row um, of First Thessalonians. And I, uh, my immediate thing about this, uh, about this particular letter, um, which is probably one of my favorite, um, favorite writings in, in all of the New Testament. Uh, but I, I, I met, I went immediately to uh, the triad that gets, the, you know, the triad with which people are most familiar is the first Corinthians 13 triad, faith, you know, faith, hope, and love. And here you have faith, love, and hope. Uh, because that is uh, that's indeed the that's indeed the message that the Thessalonians needed to hear uh, was this hope in God and uh, and that and again you know a, a preacher has to decide what their congregation needs to hear but I wonder of of sitting in this particular letter and hope and and what is it that we what, what the particularity of that hope that's expressed in this letter might be just exactly what people need to hear. Does, um, I agree. D does All Saints also uh, disrupt the, the five Sundays of First Thessalonians? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, so. Yes, I mean, thanks but, for that. But you yeah. can switch it out. I mean, if you want to yeah. spend five weeks in First Thessalonians, switch it yeah. out and, yeah, that's and right. uh, sub out the, I mean, mm -hmm. all, all Saints is such a anyway. We'll get to All Saints later, but just just to realize that you can you you can switch those out if you want to spend five weeks in this letter of encouragement, you know, yeah. which is again mm -hmm. something that might be uh, really helpful at this time uh, of the year. It, you know, in a you know, twenty twenty has um, I'm going to use a technical term now sucked in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, for me personally, for uh, for communally, for the for the world, and so uh, this letter of encouragement might be pretty pretty helpful. And on that one, I make a homiletical move. Um, I'm going to play with an alliteration here, in spite of the fact that the circumstances we live in technically sucks. Are we an inspiration, or are we inspired to? imitate Christ.